First of all, let me, uh, let me say sorry for having kept you waiting. Um, it, it shouldn't have happened. It, it did. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but we're now ready for our, our next witness, who wishes to be known as... Richard. Richard. Richard, please. Please state your full name. Richard John Warwick. And take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the and truth. And nothing but the truth. Richard, you have severe haemophilia A. Yes. And that was diagnosed at Hull Royal Infirmary when you were about three years old. Yes, two years and nine months. How did your haemophilia affect your childhood in your early years? Before I was diagnosed, I spent a great deal of time going up to my local hospital in Scarborough. They did not know what was wrong with me. The, the lumps and swellings I was getting all over my body were put down to infections. Um, they tried all sorts of different methods to try and control them with, with drugs and the like, but uh, it was mainly um, uh, splints and, and other medication that they tried, but they had no idea that there was anything to do with haemophilia. And then you described in your statement how you spent really the first eight years or so of your life in and out of hospital. Mm -hmm. You spent periods of time in traction, in casts, with ice packs. Yes, that's right. You also received cryoprecipitate. In 1970, uh, that was the first time I think I actually travelled to Hull. My parents were extremely concerned and they wanted a second opinion. I had a very large uh, swelling on my right hand, um, got a golf ball sized, and I was taken through to Hull. And uh, they gave me cryo there. They, they were extremely annoyed with the Scarborough Hospital because they, they hadn't recognised the problem. And that was the first time I had cryo, yes, in Hull. And you recalled in one of your statements a particular day where uh, you had a very swollen leg. Mm -hmm. Your leg was effectively locked and you couldn't bend it. Yes. And a burly nurse sat yeah. on it. This was, I'd probably be six or seven. It was a side room, actually, to the children's ward. Um, they laid me on a <coughs> sort of a black leather covered table. Um, Two nurses, young nurses, restrained my feet and one on my shoulders. Uh, I know the nurse's name, and she, my, my leg was locked at about, I don't know, 25, 30 degrees, and she just slowly sat down on it and pushed down on it. And I'll never forget that day, as long as I live. Um, it, was, it was just horrific. Now, in... Um, in being treated with cryoprecipitate, you had a severe reaction to it. Yes. Normally, I would be treating... I'd always get reactions to cryo, but I'd be treated with pyroton and other antihistamines to prevent reactions. Normally, I think, at a later stage, they actually gave me pyroton to start with before in the factor eight, yeah. Before the cryo, yeah. Sorry. And that was because, effectively, of an allergic reaction yes. to the cryo. Yeah. that's correct. Now, at the age of about nine... in in the middle of 1975, you were referred to St James University Hospital under the care of Dr Swinburne. Dr Lainka Swinburne, yes. And that's the point at which you were put on a home treatment programme receiving Factor Eight products. Yes, it was cryobulin. Uh, they decided it might be a good idea to start at home. Um, my dad used to go up to the, the path lab at Scarborough Pathology Department, pick it up from there um, and bring it back home. I started on cryobulin home treatment in, I think it was September 75 that I first started have, having cryobulin. You're very softly spoken, Richard, so if you if you're oh, able to speak a little closer to the microphone, there's, okay. there's a lot of people keen to hear your evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you yourself learnt how to administer it yes, as well. Yes, I started to, to administer, mix it and administer it myself, yes. And um, If we just have up on screen, please, Paul, a document from September 75, it's 1592002. Um, and we can see it's, it's not a terribly clear document, but it's a letter dated the 17th of September 1975. It's from Dr Swinburne, and it refers in the second line to your severe reactions to cryoprecipitate in spite of pyroton, 
and uh, her recommendation was that you would use freeze-dried preparation uh, and she was enclosing a note to authorise the purchase of that since it could only be done by directors of a haemophilia unit uh, and uh, cryobulin was the specific product that was there named. And you've said in your witness statement that about a, a year later, when you were about to start at Chalors, mm -hmm. which you started, I think, in September September, September 76, yes. Um, that the then haematologist, Dr Peter Kirk at Chalors, wrote to Dr Swinburne saying that you um, should be restricted to cryobulin. That's correct, yes. Now, you remained at Chalors from September 76 to July 1982. Uh, and if we just have another document on screen, 1592004, please. We can see, Richard, perhaps most clearly from the bottom <coughs> document, a date stamp, 10th of September 1976. Mm. So very soon after you would have been starting at Trelaws. Mm -hmm. And we can see there, writ large, the words hepatitis risk. Yes. Was... Uh, the, the existence of a risk of hepatitis something you or your parents were aware of at the time? Not at all. Now, you've described in one of your statements, Richard, a, a, an episode you remember from a relatively early stage at Trelaws where boys with haemophilia and other children were separated in the dining hall. What can you recall about that? OK, this would be, I would say, I would say around 1977. I was actually in, the, in Burnham House... Uh, I remember that very distinctly. Our, our housemaster was uh, Mr Green, Cabbage. So I remember that particular period at the lower school. We were, um, I can't exactly be totally sp specific whether it was the spring or the autumn of 78, but I know it was very cold. We were queuing for dinner <coughs> to the, towards the dining hall as normal. And as we were going in, um, turning into the door, there was someone that actually segregated the haemophiliacs from the other disabled children. And there were two, um, two long tables, refectory tables, and we were seated you know, around these two tables and all the play settings were laid out. And the blue plates all had red stickers on them. Um, and we looked at each other, very very confused. We just didn't know what was going on. And uh, they served us food separately. And I think the serving, the stainless steel serving dishes, as I remember, oval serving dishes, they had red mark uh, stickers on them. And it just seemed extremely strange to us that they would actually physically separate haemophiliac boys, because it was all boys at the, uh, it was a, a boys' school at the time, uh, from all the other disabled children, and that was sort of shocked us. And, and, and you've also recalled in your statement uh, an occasion where you and a number of others were taken ill. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be, <coughs> I think that was 81 gl glandular fever outbreak. Before that, Richard. Oh, right. So we'll come yeah. on to the, the glandular, or what was thought to be mm, a glandular mm. fever outbreak, but you, you've identified in your statement... Um, and it's either 1977, yes. 78, 79, yes. I, I don't think you're yeah. clear in your statement, just a, a period of time when a number of boys were ill, yes. and then not long after that mm. um, are tests in your red records for hepatitis B. That's, that's correct, yes. C can you recall anything about the nature of the illness? Um, I, think, I think a few was, were taken into sick bay, but I think it was just... Um, what I, I think at the time was just, a, 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 just a, what we thought was some sort of weird infection, you know. It just happened with, uh, with the haemophiliac boys. If we have up on screen 1592009, please, Paul. We can see here uh, um, a document from your True Laws medical records and the column's headed Serum Hepatitis. And we can see, if we look four lines down, 18th of January 79, positive, 30th of April 1979, mm. Positive, and that's uh, in the antibody column. Mm -hmm. Now, were you ever told that the tests for what was being described as then as serum hepatitis were being undertaken, or what the results of those tests were? No, no. You've 
recorded in your statements that whilst you were at your laws, blood samples would be taken perhaps every four weeks, sometimes as often as every two weeks. Yeah, there was one episode where, in my notes, there was two lots of samples taken in one month, but it was like clockwork, I would say, from September 76 through to 78 and 79, and it was basically every month. And at the end of every term, um, my doc it was usually Dr. Alan Stam, he would send you know, copies of all the test results and all my bleeds back to Dr. Swinburne in Leeds. And there were several letters, covering letters to that effect. Uh, and we'll have a look at a couple of records. Um, uh, one, one is in fact a letter to your father, 159010, mm. from Dr. Swinburne. This is 14th of November, 78. We can see reference in the second paragraph to discussing the liver problem at some length. That's a discussion that's taken place between Dr. Swinburne and Dr. Aronston. Uh, and then if we have the, on the next page... Sorry, hold on a second. Oh, sorry. Um, 1592012, please, Paul. Letter dated the 12th of December, 79. This is from Dr. Wass' effort to laws to Dr. Swinburne, and if we look in the last paragraph, we can see their reference to the SGOT <coughs> being intermittently raised since January 1979. Now, you've identified in your statement that there are liver enzyme tests, liver function tests, liver problems being identified. <coughs> yeah. Can, do you know what was discussed with you or, you or with your parents at the time about that? Nothing, nothing, to nothing that I remember... Um, relates to those tests at all. As far as I know, SGOTs, I think that was the old name for ASTs, but all of my blood tests results uh, and are actually, do are actually headed SGOT along with other enzymes, and no, um, I've had, I had no knowledge of those at all. Now, if we just look at one further document, 1592005, When we look at the top of the document, it's an orthopaedic chart for you during a, a, a part of your time when you're at Trelaws. We can see written on the top, no cryo, presumably for the obvious reasons that you had a severe allergic reaction to cryoprecipitate. And then these words, not to be included in any trial. Do you know what that refers to or what if any trials were being undertaken at Trelaws? No. <laughs> Now, you've observed in your statements, Richard, that you understood that the intention was that the Factor Eight products you'd received would be restricted to cryopulin. Yes. There was specifically a letter that was sent, um, I think, yeah, Dr. Swinburne had, had conveyed with, with Alton to Lars and asking, um, I think it was Dr. Dr. Peter Kirk at the time, whether he would... Uh, make sure that I stayed on cryo, on cryopulin rather, and he wrote back to her and confirmed that that would be the case. And I think I was on cryo for, cryobulin, beg your pardon, cryobulin for, I think it was virtually a whole year they kept me on cryobulin. And then they suddenly started treating me with haemophil, and, and then it was co-8 um, and factor 8, of course, armor factor 8. <coughs> Uh, and if we have up on screen, please, Paul, 159211. This is a letter from Dr. Aronson to Dr. Swinburne, 23rd of April, 1979. And we can see, but by this time, you're receiving a range of different products, as you've just described. Hmm. Second paragraph, since Richard has been with us, he's received a total of 208 transfusions. The material he has received is broken down as follows... Cryobulin 80, Lister 73, Factor 8 24, Haemophil 16, Co 8 15. And then there is reference in the last paragraph to uh, difficulties that we experience in supplying replacement material for 55 severe haemophiliacs and Dr. Aronson's preference not to confine you to a single concentrate. Oh, right. Uh, and it, it's Right, isn't it? You've spent some time going through your records. Yes. They show you receiving a range of different yeah. huge, Factor A huge, products. Huge range of commercial products, yes. What your records also show is that you received significant quantities of Factor 8 on a prophylactic basis. 
they were crazy about prophylaxis at Trelaws. Um, and it was like every day in some, you know, in many cases, you know, we would be coming after breakfast and going to the sick bay and uh, either something would be laid out for us or um, we'd, you know, we'd mix our own. But I mean, generally it would all be pre-prepared and it would just be every morning. You know. And there are, again, a number of, uh, of time periods in your time at Trelaws where we can see that. And we'll just look at one, merely by way of example. It's 1592023. And these are some treatment records for uh, 1982. We can see the, the product that you're receiving there is factor 8. And the treatment... And every line is prophylaxis. Mm. Yeah. Do, do you recall any discussion with you about why you received so much treatment prophylactically? No, I mean, I, I had two real target joints, and that was my left knee and my right elbow. But I, I can't understand why they would give me consecutive doses, you know, day after day, literally 20, 24 hour intervals for, for a whole month in that case. Uh, I just don't understand it. And then if we look at one further document, it's 1592013, please, Paul. This is a letter from Dr Swinburne to Dr Aaron Stam, 16th of April 1980. And there's a reference in a second paragraph to you having mild symptoms with Lister factor 8. Mm. Uh, and then in the last paragraph, suggesting it might be safer to treat you with one of the proprietary brands, by which one assumes she meant commercial brands of mm. factor eight, mm. rather than the Lister concentrator factor mm. eight. Yeah, Lister, that's the 8YL Street product, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is. Uh, I've always found that quite inter interesting because I've read a few entries like that. Uh, is has been having reactions to British produced uh, Lister. Um, 8Y. But yes, I did have reactions to it. Um, uh, as I say, I just think it's ironic that they've actually changed, swapped me from that to a, a, an American commercial product. <laughs> so, mm. Now, you, you mentioned um, glandular fever, mm. uh, and uh, you've described in your witness statement how, in about July 1981, that <coughs> there was what was suspected to be an outbreak of glandular fever amongst some of the haemophiliac yes, boys it, in Chalors. What it was, can you recall? It was summer, summer <coughs> 81, and I think there were, there were probably about 10 or 12 boys that I remember. We all sort of had this, the same sort of high temperatures and, and swollen lymph glands and, all, and the rest of it. And they, did, they ran tests on the boys. I think they did two consecutive... Uh, did one, one month and then followed it up, I think it was July and August. And they're looking for the Epstein, Epstein Barr virus, and I think in the in the notes and the comments, the doctors had written or doctor had written looks like glandular fever to me, and then the second one um, you know, just suspects glandular fever, and it was it was about ten of us, and it all happened just like that. And we can we can look at um, the document you're referring to. Uh, it's one five nine two zero seventeen. Turn it round, please, Paul. Thank you. So there's reference... Oh, no, not that. That's it. There's reference to Paul Bunnell negative. So that's the test, as you say, for the Epstein-Barr virus. Looks very like glandular fever. Uh, and then in the other test says, um, looks like early glandular fever to me. So this is 1981. And, and you've identified in your witness statement that... The, there is medical literature that links glandular fever type symptoms to early HIV infection. To early HIV infection, yeah. Um, dis oh. pro progression, yes. Now, one of the other pieces of, of research work you've undertaken has been to um, identify a link in terms of the batch of, of factor eight that you received and, mm. and a public health laboratory report. And we'll just look at those, please. 1592026. <coughs> We can see here, this is a document from the Public Health Laboratory. It's dated the 10th of September 1984, and it's headed Current Situation Regarding AIDS. The attached table and histograms are based on the reports received from haemophilia centres 
on the patients who received the same batches of blood products as the Cardiff and Bristol AIDS cases. And if we look at the next page, please, Paul, there's a histogram, and it's the top histogram we, we need, please, Paul. Histogram one, showing number of patients having received commercial factor eight related to AIDS case A1. And the bottom right-hand corner of that table, Richard, you've identified a batch number there, R6511. Yes, that's uh, armor factor eight, uh, batch R6511, yeah. Six, five, double one. And then if we have up on screen, please, Paul, document 1592051. Uh, we can see an entry from your Trelaw notes again, Richard. If we look at the third date down, 29th of June 1978, and then we read across, uh, we see there factor eight, 817, and then the batch number, R6511. You received that again on a date in July. The precise date is unclear, but it's obviously early July. And then again on the 4th of July, 1978, at R6511. And then if we look down at the Christmas term on the same page, the second entry, 28th of September, 1978, and here you're receiving it prophylactically, uh, factor 8 from R6511. Mm. Yeah. I was absolutely fascinated by this. Um, we'd got a copy of, our, copy of my Trelaw notes via Basingstoke. Um, I, was, I was delighted to, to find you know, a com comprehensive list of batch numbers, right from 1976 up to, I think it was late 1980. I didn't have the full six years. And I went on to the, um, the Tainted Blood timeline and just did a keyword search for batch numbers, and I think half a dozen popped up. And I thought, let's have, let's have a game of bingo. You know, let's just sit down with them and we'll just go through the pages. And I did a double take, and when I saw the match, because I went through each column, yeah. and I got to the end column, nothing, and no heme-fill references, and I got to the end column, and I saw R6511, ah, one, one. and it was like this, between the between the notes and I actually rang Tina at work and said when you come home I've got something to show you um, but the thing that's always puzzled me is the date this is 1978 now in that um, that report uh, that, that mentions the Cardiff and Bristol cases um, it clearly suggests these batch numbers were, were related to AIDS cases and uh, I, I still don't understand how, how it can be right, but the date, the batch numbers are there. <coughs> the, there's a letter prefix followed by, prefix followed by a four-digit number, and that is definitely armour product. And, and you know from some of the other records that you've shared with the inquiry, mm. uh, amongst the many different types of product you were given during these years at Trelaws, the armour product factor eight featured large. A very, yes. Very largely, yeah. You it started to have seizures in the summer of 1981, which was in due course diagnosed as grand mal epilepsy. Yeah. Is there a family history of epilepsy? No. <clears throat> and again, you've identified in, in your witness statement from literature and research you've looked at mm. an association between HIV infection and the onset of seizures. Yeah, Ag aggressive um, seizures can basically be an indication of aggressive HIV, early, early aggressive HIV infection. Um, you know, if, if it's not being treated and the virus level is getting incredibly high, and um, with with the HIV virus being able to cross in the, the blood-brain barrier, I think it's in about 6 or 7% of cases that um, people that have developed uh, HIV, HTL, V3, uh, go on to develop um, grand mal epilepsy or some different types of epilepsy, and it can happen very quickly. Um, and, yeah, I, I believe that's what happened to me. Um, the, year, the year is right, you know, um, if those pr previous batch numbers are correct, you know that the time frame just matches perfectly. You left Trelaws in July 1982, mm -hmm. and you 
uh, returned to the full-time care at that point of Dr Swinburne, That's in correct. terms of your haemophilia care? In Leeds, yes. If we have up on screen, please, 1592024. <coughs> We can see a letter there dated the 28th of April 1983 from Dr Swinburne to Dr Balfour at Scarborough General Hospital. And it says this, Dear Dr Balfour, this young man, like many other haemophiliacs, was severely upset by the recent Panorama programme on AIDS. After discussions with myself and his parents, he would like to treat himself with Armour Factor 8 instead of haemophil. Both companies collect their plasma by plasmapheresis from known panels of donors, all are busily engaged in screening out homosexuals, etc. In addition, ARMA have a policy of collecting only from low hepatitis risk areas, which would correspond to low AIDS area. I've not made any recommendations to the Warwicks, and in fact said I was not aware of any significant differences between the products. No UK cases in haemophiliacs have been reported in spite of millions of units of factor eight imported. Mm. Nevertheless, in view of their concern, I feel it would be wise to accede to their request he has had factor eight without problems in the past mm -hmm. because of previous anaphylactic re reaction. Richard should not receive LSV factor eight. First of all, Richard, what, if anything, do you recall about seeing that television programme and having a discussion with Dr Swinburne? <coughs> it, 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 uh, as I remember, it revolved specifically around um, Highland laboratories, Travenal Labs, and their, their product, um, yeah, yeah, their product Hemophil, and um, I, I, was, I was just shocked, I was just shocked by it, and I, I contacted, um, I can't remember whether, whether I telephoned her or wrote by letter, but I was just very anxious about, uh, you know, asking for her advice really. Uh, and uh, it would seem to follow from this letter, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that mm. you weren't given any any warnings or any reason no. to be concerned about the armour product. That's correct, yeah. Now, if we look next at 1592025, this is about a week later, 4th of May 1983, it's a letter from Dr Swinburne to you saying this, we're carrying out blood tests on haemophiliacs mm -hmm. to see if their immune reactions are normal. I know you're concerned about AIDS. If you would like to have a test, please ring my department. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recall um, either receiving the letter or what your response to the letter was? I, I probably, well, obviously I did receive the letter. I, I can't remember if I rang back though. I don't know whether I followed it up. Um, yeah, I, I think I think I think I didn't. Yeah, I don't actually rem remember receiving the letter. Um, have you, as someone who's obviously very familiar with the, such records as mm. you have? Have you ever seen any documents that suggest that after this letter in May 1983 that, that some kind of blood test was done? No, no. What we do have at 1592027 <coughs> is a letter from the end of the following year, 14th of December 1984, and I know, again, you're familiar with this, Richard. Mm. It's from Dr Swinburne, the, the bottom of the letter um, uh, it hasn't been copied, but it, Dr Swinburne to Dr Balfour. Um, and picking it up in the second paragraph, we've had discussions with Dr. Tovey and Dr. Hutchinson about heat-treated factor eight and other meetings to be held next week. There's general agreement we should switch to heat-treated factor eight as soon as possible. Heat-treated Elstree material should be available from April. In the meantime, we'll, we shall continue to use up stocks of Elstree and expect deliveries to be uninterrupted. We also agreed not to purchase any more untreated commercial material. Patients who've already had part of a batch can continue to use it until new material is available. And then there's a request to return any stocks of new batches. And then it says this in the last paragraph. We're taking samples of blood from patients prior to giving them their first dose of heat-treated material. At the moment, there are no general facilities for testing HTLV3. So I am freezing the samples until they can be tested <coughs> and compared with later samples. 
By that time, I hope we shall know how to interpret the results. Yeah. What comments you have on that later, Richard? Okay. She wrote to me regarding my concerns in, I think it was May 83? Yeah. The previous year. So if I had indeed got back to her and went in for a test, based on this letter, I wouldn't have been, she wouldn't have been able to, to do the test. This was a year previously. And the end of this letter basically states, um, I've taken a sample from Richard, which you haven't got here, I've taken a sample from Richard, um, but this was, you know, a year later. Well, how, uh, yeah, uh, even at this point, she couldn't. She couldn't do the test. Now you've um, you've got your UK HCDO records or or some of them, mm. and they show. If we have up on screen, please, Paul, one five nine two. I think it's, sorry, I don't have the reference. It's probably zero fifty. I suspect, Paul. Can I, can I just raise one, one mm. question? There is a difference, I think, mm. between the testing proposed in 1983, uh, which, according to the letter, was to test your immune reactions to see if your immune reactions were normal. As I read the letter in 14th December 84, mm -hmm. it was to test for the presence of HTLV3. There may be a difference. Um, now, we've now got your UK HCG records. If we go, mm. go to the ninth page, please, Paul. We've got here your HIV data, and the date that's given as first positive is the 27th of December 1984. Mm -hmm. Although the sample date slightly curiously appears to be three years later than that. But in any event, mm. that, that's what you've taken from your records as being the first positive. Yeah. HTLV3 HIV <coughs> test. That's correct. Now, we've got elsewhere in your medical records, Richard, a number of, of HTLV3 tests. We mm. can look at them briefly. 1592028 is <coughs> a January 85 radio immunoassay test for anti HTLV3 recorded as positive. If we go on to uh, 1592029, please, Paul. We have antibodies to HTLV3 identified as present, and that's dated 20th of December 1985. And then if we look at 1592030, please. If you look at the left-hand column, Richard, mm -hmm. halfway down, HTLV3, and then we have positive 23rd of January 1986. Yes. So a number of references, and there are plenty of others that you've drawn to the inquiry's yes, attention have, in, in, yeah. in your records in 1985, 1986, uh, 1987. Hmm. Were any of these test results drawn to your attention at the time? No, they were not. And did you even know that tests were being undertaken, other than that letter from Dr Swinburne and the sample that was going to be frozen? Other than the one from 1984, I wasn't aware that tests were being being done. Yeah. We have up on screen 1592032. This is a letter from the 1st of December 86 from Dr. Balfour, consultant haematologist at the Scarborough Hospital, to a consultant ophthalmic surgeon. Uh, and first sentence this patient is a haemophiliac HTLV3 positive. So, doctors providing you with treatment in late 1986 knew that you were HTLV3 positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have on screen 1592033, we have an accident and emergency department record from December 1986, and someone's handwritten in, in, in capital letters across that, positive to HTLV3, halfway down the page. Mm. So that's again 1986. Uh, and then last document, these purposes, 1592034, Uh, here we have the date is halfway down the page, 29th of January 1987, and again we have antibodies to HIV present down the bottom of the page. Mm. So these various references, now 86, 87, mm. Mm. were any of these passed on to you? No. 
When did you find out and how did you find out that you were HIV positive, Richard? It was uh, an appointment I had with my uh, GP in Scarborough. Um, it was sort of half routine and as I remember, he wanted to chase up the <coughs> quite recent n number of severe epileptic attacks that I'd been having going down in the street and and just, just fitting in general. And he actually told me um, in 19, it would be 1988, at that, at that routine appointment. And I remember, I remember walking home and it, it seemed, the journey seemed to take forever. Um, to, it was actually the old mum and dad's house and we, you know, we talked about it there, didn't we? Um, you you remember that, walking home that you were going to tell Tina, your fiance, yes. now your wife, who sits <laughs> beside you, mm. of the diagnosis. Mm. And one of the reasons you can pinpoint that to 1988 mm -hmm. is that you and Tina started going out in late 1987. That's correct, right? yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you were told you were HIV positive in 1988 by your GP in a, in a semi-routine Yes, appointment. yeah. Having been told by your GP in those circumstances, do you think you were given adequate information about the diagnosis? No, no. Um, it was, uh, uh, to be quite honest with you, I think, I don't know whether he was, <coughs> my, my haematologists or haematologists were, 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 were scared or whether, whether they were just unsure, whether they felt guilty even about divulging such information, especially as I was seen them for so long, you know, 10 years uh, and more. I don't know. I don't know the mindset. Uh, there were, there were, there were the, all the obvious um, TV, you know, ad runs at the time. It was, it was very scary for me uh, and for my family. But uh, I don't understand why I wasn't actually, you know, no one actually sat me down and explained uh, explain what it meant. We've got a couple of letters from about three years after that, 1991. <coughs> um, 1592040, 047 please, Paul. Um, uh, and uh, um, this is a letter to Dr McVerry from uh, mm. a, a, another doctor, and we can see in the second sentence, I understand he's been known to be HIV positive for about five years, but was only told the diagnosis a year or 18 months ago. The precise time frames may be slightly out, but mm. the delay there being yeah. recorded. And if we have 1592041, we've got a letter of the same date from Mr. Brown, consultant physician, to the GP, and this was the same GP who, who, who had given you the information. Mm. And it says this, he obviously feels very angry that Dr. McVerry withheld from him the information that he's HIV positive and this anger continues. Mm. And that's how you felt at the time. Yeah, um, it not only put myself at risk, but, but the people that I was around, including any potential girlfriends and partners, you know, and it's just, <laughs> you couldn't make it up, you really couldn't. And I, I should say, Richard, we received your second statement yesterday mm, morning, mm. so these matters have not yet been explored with Dr okay. McVerry, but they've okay. been put to Dr McVerry, and in yeah. the event a response is received, okay. that would be published. Okay. Just um, a couple of further documents. 1592036, please. Mm. And again, these are part of the materials you've supplied to the inquiry, Richard, mm. so I know you're familiar with this. This is a letter from Dr. Aaron Stam to Dr. Swinburne, June 1989. We're attempting to follow up the fortunes of extra law college boys who've been treated in our haemophilia centre in the past. I'd be grateful if you could provide me with some very simple information about these patients, such as whether they are well or not. Please feel free to use any code you like in your reply, and I can assure you of total confidentiality. And then we see Dr. Swinburne's reaction at 1592037. Sorry, Dr. McVerry's reaction. Um, uh, so Dr. McVerry writes back to Dr. Aronson, 26th of June, 1989. Dr. Swinburne forwarded your letter to me regarding this man who was an extra law college boy. 
I'm not really sure what information you would like. Um, and, and then it refers to your personal circumstances mm. and your general health. And then in the last paragraph, I think that's all I should say at this time. Please let me know if you require any further information. And I would then, of course, have to obtain Richard's permission for this. Mm -hmm. So Dr. McVeary didn't give very much information <laughs> to Dr. Aronstam, but gave had none. you been aware of this exchange of letters no. before you looked at your medical records? No, no, no whatsoever. So it was not, not brought to your attention no. at the time? Now in 1989, Tina um, became pregnant. Yes. What happened? Um, it was an un unplanned accident, shall we say. Um, and I think, we, well, we both knew that some, you know, something was amiss, and my wife knew pretty soon after. Um, she got the home testing kit and tested positive, of course, and she went to see her doctor. And we went up, you know, things were discussed, and we went up to... Um, I think it was, was it your, your doctor at Scarborough or my doctor at Scarborough? I, I don't remember yeah. exactly. But, but it, was, it was decided, in the, in, the, in the situation, the current situation, it was decided to be, well, we were advised, really, in no uncertain terms, not to go, for Tina not to go ahead. Um, it was a very bad time. I was um, fitting a lot. Um, and the, 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 we, the prognosis, shall we say, wasn't very good at all. Um, I was living on board time. I felt I was living on board time at that particular time of our lives. So <coughs> I had to have, we decided to have the termination, um, which is incredibly tough. And you put it in this way in your witness statement, mm. Richard, and I know you and Tina willing for this information to be shared. It was explained to us in very strong terms that it would be best for Tina to abort her unborn child, as there was a high probability that the child could be born HIV positive. Mm. The mortality rate of HIV positive adults was very high, and I'd been lucky to date, but was living on borrowed time. Mm. I was expected to live for up to two years following infection. There was absolutely no treatment available for HIV at the time. We were both heartbroken. Mm. I just ask you about your the circumstances in which you became aware that you had also been infected with hepatitis C. We can look at a letter on screen again, sure. Richard. It's one five nine two zero thirty eight. I hadn't been um, told at any point that <laughs> certainly not, a, not at no point I've been told. Knew nothing about uh, non A, non B. Um, yeah. And this is a letter, although we haven't got the bottom of it copied, it's from Dr. McVeary to Dr. Balfour, 28th of February 1991. And the second paragraph says that, uh, refers to persistently abnormal liver function tests. Mm. Almost certainly means he has chronic non A, non B hepatitis. Uh, then it refers to interferon. And says this, I've rechecked Richard's liver function test today. If these, are once, if these once again are abnormal, then I, I may suggest to him when I next see him that he has a liver biopsy performed to see whether he is a suitable candidate for interferon therapy or not. Mm. I did not discuss this particular point with him when I saw him today. No. No. Never, never, <coughs> op never offered a liver biopsy at that time. Perhaps uh, I dodged a bullet there, in all fairness. Because I think um, the, the standard interferon it was three injections week um, so yeah you weren't told in no. February 1991 no. that you almost certainly had no. chronic non-A non-B hepatitis <coughs> what you said in your witness statement mm. is that you were told in perhaps April or May 1993 again by your GP mm. that you had hepatitis C yes. how Physically, did your hepatitis C and your HIV infection affect you in, in the 80s and, and 90s? Um, tiredness, lethargy, um, 
Oh, sorry. I, I, I've got some notes here which. <laughs> yeah, so this is a list. I'm sorry. Um, rashes, got itch, itching skin all over. Um, yeah, fatigue, lethargy, nausea, diarrhea, that that sort of thing. You know, um, you probably heard it before, but it was that no, was not nice. You said in one of your statements the years 81 to 87 were the worst. Well, that's mainly because of my, my epileptic, epileptic attacks I was having. Um, it, was, it, it was just constant. And um, uh, the, they sort of form a dominant, dominant part of that particular part of my life, more than anything else, I think. Um, yeah, it's very difficult. Uh, and... Uh, you were started in March 1991 on AZT for the yeah. HIV infection. Side of the gene, yes. What can you tell us about the side effects of that? Um, horrific. Um, awful. I mean, it was an anti. I think it was an anti-cancer drug, wasn't it? Um, yeah. P pretty bad. You've described in your statement <coughs> dizziness, nausea, uh, diarrhea. Mm. That it was. Dreadful. Mm, so you put okay. it in probably a very understated yeah. way. And you continued on AZT from 1991 to January 1997. Six years. Six years. Six years. Yeah. I was um, also taking um, shortly after I started AZT because I think I think I started on um, I think it was initially I think it was a thousand five twice a day, which I think is a thousand. I think that was reference in a previous. Um, thing that was up on screen, and then they reduced it down, I think, to 600. Um, but they also, uh, uh, I started having, uh, I think it's called co-trimoxazole, septrin. They introduced that, so I was getting. Before I started treatment, I was getting sort of like carpets of thrush, uh, inside my mouth. It was very difficult to eat, and then. Um, um, didanazine, DDI uh, had I think it was about six weeks after starting that um, I had this in, inc these incredibly swollen feet so all my feet were swollen up and up my calves and you couldn't actually see the gaps between my toes they were, they were that bad um, that was that was very interesting a very interesting reaction but I, I, they, made, they stopped me very quickly after that uh, and then um, obviously various different over the years various different types of HIV antiretrovirals I developed quite a lot of um, mutations to the virus over the years um, I probably had about everything but I'm now on a four four combination drug therapy and touch wood it's, it's kept everything at bay even with that, you experience loss of appetite and sickness. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's after many, many years of having to go through different treatment regimes for yes. HIV, to which you developed a multitude of side effects. Yes. And resistance. Yes. You've also developed um, peripheral neuropathy. That's. Uh, I can only describe peripheral neuropathy that at least. The effects that I have from it is, if you can imagine strapping a couple of sparklers to your lower calves and just setting them off, and it's, it's that sharp, fiery-like pain in your your feet and your lower legs and your lower limbs. And particularly over the, over the last decade, I would say, I've been having another issue, which I think is related to it, is that I will my legs will go into spasms, and it's my left leg's particularly bad. Uh, this happens every night, <coughs> and I can't, I can't straighten my left leg, but the contractions are so severe that my leg goes from that to past extension, and the, the, the ends of the bones snap together, and that happens three times a second. <coughs> and that is incredibly painful. And of course, it's just bleed after bleed after bleed after bleed. Um, and it's it's frightening because you have you have no control over over your muscles and um 
it's terrifying. You actually think your bones are going to break when they go past full extension and then snap back together. And this is a, a permanent feature of your this, and nights? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's been getting worse, hasn't it? Yeah. So. In terms of hepatitis C treatment, yes. you uh, embarked upon a course with uh, pegylated interferon and ribavirin November 2003 yes. through to February 2004. Yes. That was stopped because it was not having any effect. It, it was, it st I think it stopped after it was three or four months, I think they stopped it. Um, there was absolutely no impact whatsoever on the virus, on the, on the viral load. And uh, they decided, rather than um, risk reducing the chances of a second round of treatment, you know, the, in, the, in, the, in the future, they would stop it then to give them the best chances. Uh, at a later date. What were the side effects of that course of treatment? I became I, I, I became a different person. I was only on it for 12 weeks, but I was uh, I was off to be around all night. <laughs> um, I wanting to tear my skin off. Um, it was it was so bad. Um, the rashes, the constant itching. I had a real problem with my um, my scalp. It felt like my head was on fire. The burning sensation all the time of my scalp. And it was, it was the new. I think it's psychologically as much as anything else. Uh, you you couldn't lie down because it was so painful to lie down. You knew if you were tired, but you were tired all the time. You, know, you had these these flu symptoms all the time. So even when you, 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 could, you wanted to lie down, you couldn't because it was so painful. You covered, you covered yourself in cream every day, twice a day. Bottles of Aveeno a cream, oatmeal cream. You just, I'd put it all over myself, or Tina would help putting it on me. And it was, um, it was awful. And I feel so lucky. I was only on it for the first course. I was only on it for 12 weeks said in your statement that those side effects in that first course were severe and frightening. They were frightening, yes. You became a different person and you got very frustrated mm. and angry and irritable. Mm. Very irritable, yeah. In, uh, again, in the documents you've supplied to the inquiry, we look first of all at 1592048. <coughs> This says assessment for treatment of ribavirin and or interferon for patients with hepatitis C, relative and absolute contraindications to treatment, and then about halfway down the list of bullet points is epilepsy. Yes. And then if we look at 1592047, these are some handwritten notes in your medical records. Epilepsy interferon is CI, contraindicated in epilepsy, i.e. manufacturers recommend it should not be used. Mm. And then there's a discussion about it. Uh, and then HIV and medication, patients co-infected with HIV and HCV have a lower response rate than HCV-infected patients. Mm. Do, do, can you recall whether these issues about epilepsy or the, uh, the co-infection of, of HIV were discussed with you? I think they were actually discussed at quite great length. Um, I think they were, they were keen to get me on the treatment, and I think the risks at the time... Uh, outweigh the potential benefits of clearing uh, the, the clearing hep C. So I think we sort of mutually decided to go ahead and just just keep an eye on keep an eye on things. Now, in October two thousand and four, you received a letter in, in a form which I think we've seen a number of times now, warning of the possible risk of BCJD. <laughs> and then you received letters subsequently in mm. February and July 2009. Mm. What, what can you recall about those letters and, and, and what your reaction was? Do you know, at the time, I, I thought, here we go again. There's only so much, shall we say, mud you can have thrown at you to be polite before it, it sort of stops sticking. And... Yes, it was, it was very worrying, especially at the time, um, with all the news about 
BCJD. But uh, yeah, it was just it was just a little thing, wasn't it? Yeah. it was just um, just about waiting for the next thing to come, drop through the letterbox. You know, um, what, what have they got for me this time? That sort of thing. You had a second course of treatment for hepatitis mm -hmm. C in June 2013. With telepravir, yeah. Yep, with, along with the pegylated interferon and ribavirin. Again, that didn't reduce the viral load. No. And was terminated prematurely. Yes, it was, yes. And you had similar side effects. Similar side effects. Uh, probably, probably a bit worse. Um, I think they, um, they were introducing the drug as well called GCSF. They added to that particular treatment as well. So it's something to do with your white blood cells, to try and boost those. Um, yeah, G, G hyphen CSF, I think it was. Uh, they, they tried that and it still didn't make any difference. Um, and so having had that course of treatment unsuccessful and having to be terminated, you then had a fibro scan in late 2014. Yes. And that showed advanced cirrhosis. Yeah, it was... It was, um, it was 24.8, 24, 24 I think it was, something like that. Yeah. Yes, exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Your third and final course of treatment for the hepatitis C was in August to November 2015. Yes. And what drug combination? That was uh, Harvoni and Ribavirin, I think, yeah. Was, that was a 12-week course. I think um, I found that pretty much plain sailing. Um, and, but... Uh, Compared to the previous treatments, of course, the ribavirin and interferon-based treatments, and I, although I think I'd um, well cleared the virus, it wasn't detectable at eight weeks. They decided to carry on for the for the full twelve. And you didn't have appreciable side effects, at least not in comparison to the. No, I mean the, the side effects to the to the ribavirin, you know, um, but compared to the to the peg interferon. Which, uh, which made you feel like crap. You know, it, um, nothing like, nothing mm -hmm. like. You, you had a follow-up test after six months and after one year, mm -hmm. following the conclusion of that course of treatment. Have you had any follow-up or monitoring of your liver since then? I was not since not since the first full year of of being <coughs> out clear. Uh, nothing at all. No, which is, which has puzzled me because. You would have thought they would have had continue, wanted, at least wanted to keep an eye on, keep an eye on you. So no further fibre no, scans or no, ultrasound. No, nothing whatsoever. Can I ask you about the psychological effects of the infection, the co-infection with <laughs> HIV and hepatitis C, yeah. and the treatment you received for it? Uh, specifically, hepatitis C. Um, or the HIV. Or the HIV. Well, you wish to answer, I think, generally, generally speaking, um, it's not. It's living with the viruses and the drugs, you know, to fight them. Um, obviously, there's the rashes, um, the feet, legs swelling up. Um, the, the, yeah, there's the, the so. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, anxiety, um, and something that it hasn't been talked about is that when you are, when you when you when you have HIV, you're very wary ab about being out in public. I, I basically I've been housebound for for twenty years. I haven't been able to drive or get out of the house, so I haven't mixed with the general public. At large, but it's one thing that frightens me is if I if I have a seizure or fall down or trip, and I cut myself and say bleed out by the side of the street or whatever, um, that puts other people at risk. And of course, I have to divulge my status to them. So uh, I do have, um, you know, quite. Well, almost, almost anxiety attacks and fear, fear about mixing with people, and also you probably noticed today I I have real trouble sort of putting sentences together in either 
in an unfamiliar environment or with people I hadn't seen or recognised, I'll just freeze like that. I don't think of it as a, as a brain fog. Um, as far as memories are concerned, I think of it more as a wall with random bricks missing and through those gaps I can see memories. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I'll be speaking to someone you know, fluidly and then it'll just stop. Just like shit has come down, um, but there's uh, there's dozens and dozens of Just side effects. Picking up on the issues in relation to memory, you mm. you've got problems with both long term and short term memory. Yeah, I am. And you can't recall yeah, important dates and events such as your honeymoon. Yeah. Just no recollection of it. Early. I know it was in ninety one, but I have, have no recollection of it at all. Nothing. It's just gone. You talked in your statements about one of the worst things being the feeling of stigma, the mm. feeling of being dirty. Mm. Yeah, with, with relation to to HIV AIDS in the early days, you know, um, good Christian, good Christian people don't get AIDS and all that sort of thing, and um, it was just it was just awful. Um, you felt like you were like, the lowest of the low. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were grouping people in from different um, <coughs> parts of society, um, gay plague and all that. And it was just, it was just awful. And again, I feel lucky that I wasn't. That we kept our heads down. You know, and what we, the whole family never just didn't talk about it. Didn't talk about. It. Even though there was the the connection there with, with me being haemophiliac and there, was, there was obviously that that risk but it wasn't talked about at all not even close family parents mm -hmm. used to talk about it you've mentioned anxiety you, you've also experienced depression mm. yeah and you've experienced guilt at being a survivor from Trelaw yes yeah um, I often I just think, why me? You know, why am I still here? What, what, what have I done differently? Um, I just, I just don't understand why I'm still here. Was it, was it different factor eight? Was it, was it sorry? Was it different um, concentrates? Was it different lifestyle? And we're all in the same place, <coughs> you know. Oh, okay, I was there um, a couple of years earlier than, than others, but. Yeah, it's just it's just guilt of, of losing all all those friends. I mean, I can name ten that I knew that have just gone. Um, it's horrific. There's one Trudeau's boy, Andrew, who lived not far from you, and you wanted to specifically mention him. Yeah, in in 1976, uh, my parents knew um, a lad that wasn't too far away, let's say 15 miles away from us, who had haemophilia. And my dad, my father and his father, we used to take it in turns to shuttle our respective sons to the train station for the long train journey down to King's Cross at the beginning of each term. And it was alternate. And I think it was a couple of years ahead of me. And when, when I left, uh, when I left to Lars in, in 82, uh, I think he, he would have already been um, back home. And unbeknown to us, when we, shortly, about a year after we got married, we got a, a bungalow, and it happened to be within a mile of where he lived. Um, and I think I'd, I spoke to him on the phone once and uh, <laughs> we, jo we joked and asked him, um, have you got the lurgy? Meaning um, HIV. And we sort of laughed and joked about it. Um, and that was the last time I spoke to him and it wasn't until quite a few years after that we'd read, uh, we'd, we'd heard that um, 
he died. And the reason he died was because his wife had had a heart condition um, and she died and he just stopped taking his HIV meds and consequently he died <coughs> shortly, after, shortly afterwards. And I'll never forgive myself for not actually going to see him, even though it was such a short period of sh short distance away, and just speaking to him because I feel as though I could have made the difference by visiting him in, in that time of need. Um. Richard, one of the observations you've made in your witness statement in terms of the psychological impact of the HIV medication, mm. and you made this comment by reference to AZT, mm. is that one of the dreadful things about having to take it was that it's a constant reminder yes. that you have yes. HIV. Yes, yeah. Um, as, as all antiretroviral drugs are, you know, um, you have to take them twice, in my case, twice a day. But uh, in, in the early days, and we, we had a horrible incident when we went to collect drugs and we from the hospital, we had to go into a, a basement to collect the ZW, um, AZT Retrovir. Um, we, we, it was stored separately from normal medication and uh, we just felt like dirt having to go down there together and to specifically collect AZT. And, and they, they ran out of it, I think, on two occasions and they had to get it restocked. It didn't happen at the hospital. And this is when I was supposed to be taking it on a regular basis, but that was so demoralising. You know, just, just, just felt awful, yeah. Let me ask you a little about the impact on your family and, and your private and family life. You're, you said in your statement that your parents had gone through hell. Yes, and then some. Uh, they've supported me. I've seen, they this, saw this what I went through as a, as a toddler, as a child, and not been diagnosed for so, so long. Um, and then after that, it's just been, it's just been constant for them. Um, every step of the way, I mean, they've been so supportive. But um, I know it's been awful for my extended family as well. You know, they've had to to go through it all. Um, okay. You. <laughs> Anything? You said yeah. you have an extremely loving and supportive wife. Yes, and she's she's everything to me. Yeah. Um, sorry. A source of great sadness to you both has been that you haven't had children. Yeah. And you've said in your statement that sperm washing and IVF became available too late for you. Yeah, there was a, there was a guy in um, I think a guy in Italy. Uh, they call him the Mad Doctor. Um, he, he developed this technique for, for sperm washing and other, other medical professionals, sorry, other medical professionals uh, didn't, didn't like it at all. You know, they, you know, he's putting people's lives at risk, but he was giving people hope in Italy. I forget the guy's name, um, but he was, he was doing sperm washing and it was a fair few later, years later when, um, when it became available in the UK, but it was, it was just too late for us. Mm. And for the reasons you've explained, you and Tina decided to buy a small bungalow in a quiet area mm. so that you could lead the very quiet, very private yeah. life we were, you described. We were <laughs> terrified that, you know, if something had got into the, um, into the community, if rumours had got spread about, um, it would have been, it would have made our lives hell. So we just moved somewhere quite a way out of town, um, Little, little two bed bungalow, just one neighbour a fair distance away. Um, it's probably, in hindsight, it was probably a bad move because with me not being able to drive and, and, and Tina being, well, she works part time because she has to look after me, but I'm stuck in that one place most of the time. And um, it might have, might have been better that we did try and get a bit nearer. <coughs> Um, but yeah, um, it's, it's quiet. That's the main thing, it's quiet. You'd 
wanted to become an electronics or software engineer, but the combination of HIV infection, epilepsy, severe haemophilia, and the treatments you've undergone mm. for both your infections have prevented that. The thing is, um, what's really prevented me, I can't, I can't entirely blame my um, career problems um, solely on the HIV, hep C co-infection, but combined with the epileptic attacks, um, <laughs> which were which are quite frightening even to myself. Um, I was a danger not only to myself but to others. In, in the workplace environment that would have been unacceptable. So it's, it's been very difficult. Um, and these viruses have, have had such a profound um, effect on my life in general. They've, affected, they've, 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 they've defined, my life's been defined by these viruses. I've, the thing is I've known nothing, I haven't known anything different. This is what people sort of say to you, you know, how these, have these viruses affected your life? Well, if it's, if it's all you've known, you know, you haven't really known anything different. It's, I mean, most of the time, I mean, um, constant pain. One of the reasons today I've sort of been perhaps burbling on a bit and not stringing sentences together, I have, I have um, constant pain in all my joints and I have to take some degree of analgesics to keep that bearable. Um, and the side effects of all the other drugs as well for the epilepsy, which tends to pull you, slow you down, sodium valproate. The, the original uh, epilepsy drugs I was taking, I think I mentioned it, ep epinutin, that caused me gums to uh, overgrow. I lost loads of teeth. Um, they w it wasn't working. They tried me on gabapentin and all sorts of different things. But all these, all these different, this combination of all these different cocktail of drugs, and the pain and the arthritis, and I'm not not be able to to walk properly. It just drags you drags you so far down. Um, and people say, "Oh, you're looking well today, Richard. How are you?" And you think, "Okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks for that compliment." Yeah. <laughs> the, the financial impact of, of everything you've described has been immense yes because you've not been able to work it's, it's yeah obviously if you can't go out and, and, and work that's, that's bound to have a, a financial effect it's, it's, it's not being able to provide but on a personal level for my family for my, for, for my wife um, and it it really does play on your mind. You know, you're not able to to provide what what we need. Um, and it's uh, it's not it's not it's not all about money either. It's um, it's the dignity. It's the dignity of being able to to to, to have a pr productive, lead a productive life. Uh, be a productive member of society, if you like, that you can contribute to society. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, sort of just been, just been denied that, really. And you've been unable to obtain life insurance, and that distresses oh, yeah. you because you can't provide for Tina yeah. in the event of your death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that applies, I think, across the board with anybody that's... Uh... You've... You've had limited forms of counselling offered to you mm -hmm. from time to time, but nothing that you've wanted to no. take up or thought would no. be helpful. No, it's just not. It's it's just not my thing. To talk about. I, I I tend to I tend to have a sort of a very regressive attitude. I sort of keep everything in. I sort of put a shell around myself, if you like, when I'm talking to other people, and I try and deal with my own problems by um, doing things online for, for other people. I mean, many, many in this room will know me for the work that I do for, for, the, camp, for the campaign. It's not, it's not for the campaign per se, it's for actually giving people the opportunity to see what they've done. You know, if they've been on radio or TV or whatever, or if there's some new news out, it's just for them. You know, it forms part of the big jigsaw puzzle of people's voices 
people and people's feelings and for it to be a part of, of, of history, if you like. And, and that, in addition to your family, is where you found your support yes. through that community? Yes, 100%, yeah. They are my extended family. There's just there's one specific treatment that you say that you would alleviate some of your pain, and that's hydrotherapy. Mm, from my joints. Uh, Can you get that? It, no, it's become... None, none of the trusts seem to be interested in providing it. Um, we'll come on to those later. Um, but no, it was so beneficial to me. I used to have it at, at Trelaw's, at Trelaw College, and it made such a difference. You know, it's more than the hot bath. You could, you know, you could really, you could really ease your joints up. You could do exercises because I can't do much in the way of physical exercises because I just set bleeds off. Um, but that was really beneficial. Uh, we thought about sort of investing in a hot tub. But it's, it's not the same. It's not the same. But hydro is something that I think our, our nearest hydrotherapy pool is oh, about 30 miles away. And I think there was one, one private Booper hospital that could provide it. But that's something I really miss, yes. You participated in the 1991 HIV litigation. Yes, yes. And you signed some form of waiver. <laughs> that, I think that was in Sheffield, wasn't it, Tim? At um, that time in 1991, you were in fact <coughs> hepatitis C positive, but didn't know. Didn't know it, no. <laughs> it's just. Uh, what what's <coughs> been your experience of the process of approaching the trusts and schemes hmm. for financial assistance? Okay. Well, to start with, um, I think we only ever made one one um, claim to the MFT, and that was for. Money towards a car, a replacement car. We had an old Datsun Bluebird, a coupe, coupe a dashing blue vinyl top. And uh, we went all over the place in it. Um, but there's a problem that it had holes in the floor, um, particularly on the passenger side. And it was just, it was just getting dangerous. And we, all we wanted was some, some money towards a, new, a replacement vehicle, not a new vehicle. And we were, we were flatly refused on that. And I think we ended up buying, we ended up saving from buying a, a Nissan Bluebird as opposed to a Datsun Bluebird. So, um, as far as, as far as the Skipton Fund goes, um, yeah, I think we've had, uh, we've had a couple of, we had some, the, the usual cliche double glazing, um, Help, help, help for double glazing. Yeah, we did get that. We, yeah, did that, get that. we did get that. We had to um, chip in quite. We to, yeah, we had to find chipping quite a lot of money towards it because of the three quotes that they they require. They give you the um, you know, the, go, the go along with the lowest quote always. And as it happens, when the guys had um, finished, shall we say, quote unquote, fitting the double glazing, it was uh, it was rubbish. It was. We had to get somebody else in to, to put the job work right, and then they went into liquidation, just to add an insult to injury. So that was our um, that, that was our experience with Skipton from What else have we had from them? Not much. No, the um, the MFT was brilliant when it first started up. They had these uh, weekends. I think they were once every. Two years, um, something for the weekend, and uh, which is where partners could go as well, and um, men only weekends, and there was respite care, um, nice hotels and the like, and that was um, a mistake. They stopped that within a few years, but that's where we could all get together um, and sort of share our experiences, but the. Um, the process of getting help through the trusts, as was, and I believe as is, is today, is just awful. So many hoops. It's so demeaning. Um, it's just, just an awful, awful process. It makes you, makes you feel like a beggar. And you've, you've described it as intrusive, demoralising... Mm. And monotonous. Well, not, yes, yes. 
Richard, those are the questions I have for you. Is that anything you would like to add? <sighs> yeah. Um, just a little, a little summary. Um, listening to the stories and testimonies of those infected and affected is both heartbreaking and humbling. I respect and honour the courage, dignity and bravery shown by our small and rapidly diminishing community. I have made great many friends and acquaintances over the last 20 years whose circumstances vary widely and we all love and support each other. But the one emotion that has been building and growing for, for over 30 years is that of anger. The rage I feel at being lied to, dismissed and pushed aside, when all we ask for is recognition of our plight and meaningful recompense for the lives we've had so cruelly stolen from us. Instead, we've been treated with disrespect, disdain, and as if we are irrelevant. A group of people who shouldn't have expected any better because by some, haemophiliacs are already disadvantaged and deemed less than members of society. We should go away, not question our betters, and die quietly. The truth is, having haemophilia does not prevent a person having a successful career, a family life, or prevent them from being a full and contributing member of society. There are extra challenges, especially for severe haemophiliacs, but many disabilities and conditions, whether genetic in nature or not, require making adjustments without compromising a successful life. However, being multiply infected absolutely prevents life, a normal life being possible. Sufferers are consigned to the fringes of society, forever fearful of public reaction, without support from life or mortgage insurance, and all the usual ways that people can protect themselves and their families from hardship through being unable to work. Desperately sick, exhausted and terrified about the future, this is the result of decisions made by those who were paid to do better. In the comfort of their offices, they pushed papers across desks, set aside the warnings and decided to gamble with other people's lives for the goal of saving money it is hard to avoid the conclusion that we were deemed expendable, collateral damage. I want to thank my loving, supportive parents, my family, and above all, my wonderful wife, who has been my rock throughout this living nightmare. She has steadfastly stood by me in the most difficult of times. I would also like to recognise and thank the campaign groups, and in particular, the Tainted Blood community, for their unending support and friendship. We have campaigned together, grieved together and shared stories together. You have all played a huge part of my life and helped me get through this. And finally, thank you to Sir Brian and the Inquiry team for allowing me to tell my story. Thank you. Chair, I'm just going to ask Mr Snowden if you just give me a moment. Nothing further, Richard. There, there is, there is one question, which I, I'd like to, to ask you, if I, if I may. Uh, I'm sorry for asking a question uh, after, uh, after what you've just been, been saying, but it, it's this. I wonder if we can have zero four eight back, Paul. And if you go over leaf to the handwritten part. Mm -hmm. 
should be a, a handwritten page, I think. That's 047, sir. 047, thank you. Um, this is when you, you remember there being discussions between yourself <coughs> uh, and the hospital. Uh, under the heading epilepsy, the second sentence, the hospital takes responsibility for prescribing it. Mm. So here is the hospital about to give you interferon, which is counterindicated, uh, and they're saying or noting that they take responsibility for prescribing it. Mm. Did they tell you what they meant by taking responsibility? No. Do you remember them saying so? No. That's all that I have to, to ask. Um, can I say that it has been deeply impressive to me that someone who's spent a lot of his life wishing to be private, uh, who knows that in public he may struggle from time to time with bits of memory, is nonetheless prepared to come uh, and share what is deeply personal, not only with those people who are here, but uh, with the world uh, out there. It matters to me that you have done so. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Quarter past three. Thank you, sir. Quarter past three.